Okay, time to get some work done. What's up, you beautiful mother? If you followed me for a while, then you know exactly how much of a Slack hater I've been because of the scene that I just played out for you. However, it wasn't until I brought on my team that I realized that Slack is actually one of the best product tools on the market. Shocker, I know. <laughs> But newsflash, you can't just create a channel and hope for the best. So if you're using Slack for your community or for business, stick around because I'm going to share a handful of simple strategies that you can implement to tap into Slack's true power for your own brand. My initial introduction to Slack was community-based, like most people. The organization I worked for utilized Google Hangouts, now known as Chats, and so when I kicked off my freelancing career, I simply emailed clients. I had no need for Slack itself. It was simple. But even as time went on as a solopreneur, I really didn't see the need to create a real-time conversation stream for the majority of my clients. But the more I got into freelancing, the more communities and courses that I joined, many of which operated on Slack and in horribly different ways. It was a free-for-all. Every single space that I was a part of, the constant dinging and all of the channel mentions made me not want to participate in that space at all. And so one day, I decided to just remove myself completely or mute the groups completely. Then at the beginning of this year, I brought on two assistants at my agency systems and at the same time had one of the biggest projects to date who wanted to operate solely off of Slack Enterprise. This was my chance to actually build a space the right way, to learn about the features that Slack had that I frankly didn't really know much about and create an environment that fostered collaboration, not created what I call the cubicle crutch. I coined the term cubicle crutch way back in 2021 as a way to describe the misuse of seeing coworkers online, aka relying on that cute little green available dot to ask questions instead of utilizing their own digital literacy skills to find the answer and then complete the task themselves. You can read more about it in my Medium article that I've linked down below in this video. So between this client project and now setting up my team for success, there were three features that I knew existed but had never used before and immediately saw the value of them after learning more. The first is Slack Connect. This allows you to create a channel with people outside of your organization for a project, for instance. For every paid Slack seat in your workspace, you get four seats of Connect free. Next is channel folders, which allow you to bookmark and save information specific to that channel. And lastly, Slack Canvas, which is basically Slack's version of a Google or Notion doc to take notes, save information, all inside of the app. And as a bonus, Slack lists were recently released, which I'll talk about later in this video and how we're using them for our own space. But we do have to take a step back and do some prep work before we set up these features or else like all of the communities I was in, our own Slack account will become the Wild West. And that is something that I don't think anybody wants. I thought we could settle this like men. You thought wrong, dude. So aside from the unending notifications, my other pet peeve was channel structure. Most Slack spaces that I've been a part of really don't give much thought to the names and purpose of their channels. Or worse, have I've seen them constantly changing the channels and causing confusion for users. So here's a great example. I recently launched a co-working club here in Austin, and so I posted about it in Freelancing Females in their Slack community, in the channel called Meetup. Sounds right, right? Wrong. Apparently, it was supposed to go into shameless plug, so my post was deleted make it make sense. I, I don't really understand. So it's not only important to name your channels correctly, but actually give them a description and pin that description. Don't just put it in the little channel bio, actually give a dedicated message so that people know what the expectations are there. And keeping the channels to a minimum is also very important. It's easier to add more channels than remove the clutter later. And so at systems, this is kind of what our channel structure looks like. First up, we have announcements. So that's kind of our weekly stand up. I share updates on clients and internal projects with my team. We have client work for tracking deliverables internally, projects for internal projects. Circleback is where all of our AI notes get added after the meetings automatically. So I don't have to shuffle around and go find things. It's all in one place. 
Then we have internal processes, which I feel like is pretty obvious there. And then finds. Our finds channel is for new features of tools that we use and or build on clients that maybe we find that we didn't know existed or were recently launched and we want to make sure that we pay attention to those. And then lastly, we have a dedicated Slack Connect channel with every single client. The next most important thing to develop is channel etiquette, aka how do you expect people to show up and engage inside that channel? Notifications aside, this is why I think people find Slack the most annoying and overwhelming. So to reduce the chaos, you have to be what I call a thread forward thinker, meaning every message should start with a thread and every response goes into that thread. It's a way to keep every thought, collaboration, question, request, all in one place. And I've seen so many communities where either people don't know to reply to a message as a thread or think that they're responding back to someone. In turn, the initial poster doesn't get a notification and the channel becomes a shit show. <laughs> Now, one thing I'll add here that works for our internal project channel is posting each deliverable as its own message so we can track them separately. And to reduce notifications even further, I did not want to build a system where I was constantly getting notifications for new messages saying, working on it, got it. I wanted my team to have a simple, quiet touch point, which is why we developed our emoji notification system. These emojis are universal to our workplace. No matter what channel you're on, we use the following. So the eyes emoji, this is the person assigned has seen or, and or read the new thread. A green check mark, so the person assigned has actually shown that they've completed the task. A bell notification showing that this thread is important and a priority. Sometimes we get client um, edit requests or bugs that we need to kind of put above everything else we're working on for the day. So this is a great way to do that. Then we have the bell with the red slash through it. That means that this thread is important, but it's not a priority. So you have 48 hours to complete, basically, unless we say otherwise. Then we use the construction zone sign emoji for me. So this is that the project manager has feedback. Um, then I obviously follow that up with new messages in the thread. So the project's not done. We have some edits to make. And then lastly, for a fun little way to say that the project is done, I use the disco ball to approve any work that was requested. The greatest part of our emoji system is how much less time I actually personally spend on project management. Every morning, I set aside 10 to 15 minutes to quickly glance at each thread and the emojis on them to get an idea of where my focus is going to be for the day. Okay, so now that the foundation has been laid, let's talk about all of those extra features that not only maximize our Slack workspace, but create a better experience for all users. So every client we work with outside of general consulting receives a Slack Connect channel. I have this template that I use for the initial message that I customize and then pin to the top. Then we utilize folders for bookmarks, such as the client's Miro board, workbook, and any other resources they may have sent us. We keep a separate folder for project notes, which are then linked back from Circleback. Now let's talk Slack Canvas. Do I think you should have multiple note-taking wikis? Absolutely not. Do I think that Slack is a useful alternative for storing information for short-term projects? Absolutely, yes. And in fact, you can actually push canvases out of Slack using Zapier into Notion or Google Drive or another tool. So that way you can work in one place in real time and then push them to an archive for later reference if you choose to delete those channels. So most recently launched is Slackless. I just got access to them about a week ago. And if any tool is going to release a project management feature, this is what I expect it to be. Like canvases, you can create and link lists across any of your channels to group various information together. As my team has slowly moved away from managing projects in Notion, lists have honestly been the missing piece to having a truly cohesive workspace in one tool. And I know that you are gasping in productivity, but I've said this for years, if Notion improved their commenting feature, I would jump back in arms wide open. But until then, Slack is killing it for our small but mighty team. All in all, I am not afraid to admit that I was wrong about Slack, but I am also not afraid to point fingers for steering me in the wrong direction either.